Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us tonight. This is our second event marking the 20 years since the 9-11 attacks in 2001. As a reminder, you guys are free to use the chat. If you have questions for our presenters, I'll keep track of those questions and we can ask them at the end. And at the end of the night, we'll give you an attendance link, which is how you get credit for being here. So my name is Misty Wilson-Mertens, and I'm just hosting this tonight. We're going to hear from three of our government faculty members that are going to talk to us about how this watershed event changed both our government and politics. So we're going to hear from Kimberly Cox, Rick Sagel, and Joan Johnson. Thank you all for being here, by the way. Thanks right, for having right. me. Sorry. <laughs> I love your picture, Rick. This is very Do you? cute. Do you? It's not quite as professional as the other two, yeah. but it's nice. Cute was not the right word there, but I appreciate it. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and hand this off to Professor Cox to start us off with tonight. Hello, everyone. Um, I wanted to, oops. Apologize, let me get this started. I wanted to start with saying that as we approach the 20th anniversary of 9-11, I think it's important to look at the attack as a major historic event that shaped not only the landscape of New York City, um, but also the long government in the United States. So prior to 9-11, the United States had spotty or limited experience with terrorist attacks within the main U.S. territory. So other than lone wolf actors such as Timothy McVeigh in Oklahoma City in 1995, whoops, it's going fast, sorry. Sorry. Uh, other than um, lone actors such as Timothy McVeigh in Oklahoma City in 1995, most attacks on the U.S. were overseas. Um, there's one exception in 1993. There was an attack on the World Trade Center where three people died and thousands were injured, but building damage at that point was minimal. So overseas, though, we saw examples such as the attack in 1906 of the Kobar Towers complex in Saudi Arabia, the bombing of the U.S. Embassy in 1998, and the attack on the USS Cole in Yemen in 2000. But there was almost this thought, I think, that nothing bad would happen within the United States, and many afterwards would say that we weren't giving the possibility of a terrorist attack the attention that was needed. So a good example of this is the coal attack. The coal attack actually took place on October 12th, and there was a vice presidential debate on October 17th, and the words coal and terrorism are only mentioned once if you go back through that debate, uh, which seems really, really low. Um, and you also have people within the administration like Richard Clark raising the issue of al-Qaeda with what he says without much response uh, from others. I apologize. It's kind of going a little bit crazy there. Okay. So also the 9-11 attacks were uh, different in that they were the first major non-state sponsored terrorist attack within the domestic geography of the United States. Uh, mutually assured destruction, for example, was in place prior to 9-11 to deter state actors. And, and yes, we did have conflicts um, happening in surrogate countries around the world, but nothing that really touched the main U.S. territory. So we had rules and laws on how to fight aggression um, of the type when it happened overseas, um, but the 9-11 Commission report would show that we had a lot of holes in what to do when this type of attack happened inside the U.S. territory. Um, so, for example, Timothy McVeigh was investigated, caught, prosecuted, Executed and put to death using civilian U.S. laws. Um, how, though, were we to deal with foreign non-state actors who did not fear death and were willing to kill civilians on U.S. soil? That was a big question. Um, what tools were at our disposal and how do we balance our approach with the Constitution and civil liberties of U.S. citizens um, were the questions that arose as well. So the tax also um, were a little bit different in that they there was no clear warning and conflicts prior they'd had a little more time they developed more slowly over time so officials didn't know if it was the only strike or if more would follow and this meant that they felt that they had to act fast often without all the information so some of the laws created after 9-11 were criticized for being implemented too hastily um, and also not researched enough for the applicable consequences Um, at the time of the attack, nation state threats fell neatly into how we dealt with war historically, too. Law enforcement had rules on, on how to deal with traffickers, criminal networks, for example, and there were different rules on how they could deal with domestic versus foreign actors. 
There were also territorial rules of nation states to consider, and war was seen as having, as really no way thing, operating outside of our borders. So the laws on terrorism were very much set for outside the U.S. territory. Domestically, we were more restrained as to what we could do under the laws applicable inside the U.S. Those investigating and prosecuting had to work within the bounds of applicable laws, such as arrest, search and seizure, habeas corpus, and Miranda rules. Moreover, they did have to take into account privacy and civil liberties of individuals. So, for example, again, in a criminal case against a drug lord, the government would indict and then try to get that person extradited for trial. So, with bin Laden, instead, they used lethal force, and that was different because um, prior to his death, bin Laden was under indictment uh, for acts in Africa, but this did not halt at all his efforts around the globe or within the U.S. Um, other things that I wanted just to touch on really quickly were security threats since the end of the Cold War, globalization and technology. Uh, so you have a, a small amount of actors that could do a lot of damage, and that used to be kind of relegated to nation states. So um, nation states also, too, we had to look at did they have control um, over their entire sovereign um, territory? So 9-11 revealed that in Afghanistan, for example, Al-Qaeda had recruiting training camps and labs with biological weapon experiments. And these groups within um, Afghanistan could basically do as they pleased without much fear of government intervention at the time. Both Congress and the executive branch began to look at the causes and what changes or restructuring needed to happen. Um, the 9-11 Commission was set up by Congress to investigate and make recommendations to the executive on laws, and recommendations were made uh, that focused effectively on preventing and preparing for, and if necessary, how to respond to terrorist attacks. So they're going to look at the capabilities of state and local governments, first responders, and the private sector. This chart shows the complicated web of government that existed prior to 9-11. Uh, so we're going to look here in a second at a different chart, but there was a consolidation of 22 disparate agencies into an umbrella under Homeland Security. So after 9-11, uh, President Bush put out a proposal to create the Department of Homeland Security that was more streamlined and consistent, uh, consisted of four sections. It had border and transportation security, emergency preparedness and response, chemical, biological, radiolog radiological, and nuclear countermeasures, and information analysis and infrastructure uh, protections as well. So how did all this change how we live? Preemptive military stripes, uh, strikes and ongoing wars, indefinite detentions, uh, waterboarding, wiretapping, which clearly uh, tested the Fourth Amendment search and seizure provisions of the Constitution, and more invasive airport security are just a few items. And so what I'm going to cover at this point is by no means exhaustive, but I wanted to provide a glimpse into a few of the bigger changes that happened um, as we kind of wrap our minds around how we're going to deal with law uh, post 9-11. So one of the biggest tools legally for the, uh, and I apologize again, it's going forward. Okay, sorry about that. One of the biggest tools legally was the USA Patriot Act, and it was passed within weeks of the attack with only one or two votes against it in Congress. So it's basically an umbrella of all sorts of claims of executive privilege. So the act stands out, uh, stands for, you can see they're uniting and strengthening America by providing appropriate tools required to intercept and obstruct terrorism. And generally it's going to expand search and surveillance powers of the federal government and intelligence agencies. So, and also these uh, tools that they need to intercept and obstruct terrorism. Specifically, it will also allow law enforcement within the U.S. the ability to do more wiretapping um, and surveillance, uh, so to delay notification of search warrants that are happening and just to broader use warrants across the U.S. boundaries. Uh, the act was designed to keep out uh, terrorists to end the statute of limitations for certain crimes related to terrorism so they'd have more time to pursue them, harsher penalties for perpetrators, and stronger information sharing and cohesion between government agencies was another uh, big advantage. Now, I know on this slide there's a lot of information, so I just want to highlight a, a few of the items and how vast the changes were. So you can read through them, but Section 201 and 202 added computer and terrorist crimes to the list of serious offenses that law enforcement could seek uh, court orders uh, to spy on. Uh, Section 215, I'm going to kind of jump down, includes the power of the government to demand library borrowing records. It also included medical records and other business records. 
411 labeled uh, labeled a person a terrorist if they belong to an activist group which is involved in terrorism. And 505, they could demand information from telecom companies and block them from informing that a person is being uh, spied upon. So is this still act, is the act still around? Yes and no. It's gone through an evolution. 2005 was the original expiration date. And then in 2006, we have the USA Patriot Act and Terrorism Reauthorization Act. It included new provisions on the death penalty for terrorists and new provisions, particularly with the financing of terrorism, which is a big provision of this act. The really important one, though, is it made 14 of the original 16 uh, provisions, sunset provisions, permanent. There were a couple, though, um, that require uh, reauthorization by Congress. They're the roving wiretaps track tracking lone wolf terrorists and the power to demand records from businesses and institutions. Those have to be reauthorized by Congress every four years. Then in 2012, President Obama signed the Patriot Census Extension Act, which extended these four year requirements. And um, those were extended until 2015 would be the next time. So there was a problem um, in 2013, though, Edward Snowden, who was working for the NSA, blew the whistle on the misuse of Section 2015, which is that business records provision. And under 2015, the government could collect a broad range of data from individuals, and it's, the key is in bulk. So, for example, they required Verizon on an ongoing basis to give information on all calls, both foreign and domestic in their system. So that's a lot. <laughs> and then there were also these national security letters asking for the same information in bulk from the FISA courts. So the court looks at all this eventually and shoots it down and it says that this bulk collection would be an unprecedented unprecedented con uh, contraction of the privacy expectations of all Americans. So in a nutshell, no bulk collection anymore, but you can still do under certain circumstances individual collection of data. Now, the USA Freedom Act of 2015 um, would be kind of the next part, and um, it basically restored and modified the Patriot Act. It barred bulk collection and those national security letters from also doing bulk collection, and the government must now go to the FISA court first, and the court must make its major decisions public for transparency. Now, this one was set to expire in 2019. The Trump, and, uh, Trump administration and Congress did reauthorize it for three months, and then in March of 2020, it was re the Reauthorization Act uh, came up, but Trump threatened to veto it, and the bill was postponed indefinitely um, due to investigations of political campaigns was Trump's main uh, beef with it. Uh, so that that's, again, the majority of the provisions were permanent, but those ones that need to be reauthorized, those are the ones that are going to be the issue here. What was in and what was out? Uh, new restrictions included a new public advocate in FISA hearings, so a public person, uh, an advocate that would um, look at the uh, what was going on, uh, require more transparency, and new restrictions on bulk data collection. Expansions to the law included an expansion of the type of data they could collect. It went from landlines, cell data, to video chats and smartphone activities, so that was an expansion. And they could still use broad searches to target large portions of the population, um, also from connected contacts, which has been a really big uh, point that a lot of people um, don't like. And any company that voluntarily hands over data will be protected with blanket immunity from lawsuits, even if they violate their own customer privacy terms. So uh, those are kind of some of the main things along with, um, I think the other big one is the last point there where the uh, FISC advocate, the FISA court advocate, um, the FISA court, if they deem something uh, national security or secret, they can block that transparency as well. So is it derailed uh, or gone? Um, COVID kind of had an impact that last, you know, during the Trump administration, uh, beef that he had with Congress and some of the provisions, um, kind of that, that was a derailment, um, especially on those three controversial provisions of roving wiretaps, uh, the lone wolf provision, provision for et cetera. But one thing to note on that is any investigations that are currently going, that were currently going on, prior to the uh, sunset, those can still continue. It's just new um, investigations under those controversial provisions that cannot continue. Um, and also to note that there's uh, other acts that that cover some of this. Um, the FISA Act of 1978, for example, there's no judicial authorization needed to spy on foreign powers mostly, and but you do need judicial authorization for spying on U.S. citizens after 72 hours and you need probable cause. But again, there's a lot of other acts that kind of take the place of some of the expiration or the, the things that have been put on pause. 
There's also been renewed talk after January 6th. Uh, there was renewed talk about the need for domestic terrorism laws and updates to that. You can see where Representative Slotnick tweeted on January 8th about that, uh, that we have a new threat of domestic or internal terror that is due to ideological and political division within the country. President Biden also right after January 6th in one of his first official posts stated that he plans to make uh, at a party to pass laws on domestic terrorism and also people are calling for more funding for extreme fighting extremism in, in America, including red flag laws, which would make it uh, uh, where law enforcement could temporarily take guns out of the hands of people deemed dangerous under under the, the law. After 9-11, there were also a series of secret memos that I wanted to mention that came out that have an impact on the expansion of executive power. These came out of the Office of uh, Legal Counsel and the Department of Justice. And so they weren't known about, they were released by Obama in 2009. And what they did is they expanded executive authority by giving legal cover to actions by the executive branch. So these memos did things like allow surveillance programs for phone and emails with no judicial approval, convening military commissions without going to Congress, um, sending people to Guantanamo, power to create military commissions, power to torture, potentially uh, render people from one country to another, uh, conduct surveillance. It was broad sweeping. All of this happens out of the memos and no one knows while it's going on that they're using these. They do not need congressional approval because technically these are not making law. They're only interpreting law under existing rules and thus not executive orders even. Um, so that was kind of a big surprise to a lot of people. Um, detention and torture that came out of this is another thing I just wanted to touch on really quickly. Um, the, the memos and the new laws did, uh, we had a lot of issues uh, with detention and torture, especially Guantanamo Bay, uh, if, if, if the, the detention of enemy combatants, as well as at Abu Ghraib in Iraq. Uh, there were issues of torture and indefinite detention and violations of rights uh, that were raised by many attorneys and, and many uh, people that were uh, critical of the administrations. And in three court cases, the three court cases I listed, you can see where some of this was refuted and found unconstitutional. Um, Abu Ghraib's closed, obviously, in Iraq, uh, but there are approximately 40 detainees remaining from Guantanamo. Biden has cleared the release of nine to other countries since he's been in office, and three of those were just within the last month. Uh, the reality is, though, is if you are held <laughs> under these laws, you're going to be there for a long time because these types of cases take years and get bogged down in pretrial procedure and, and appeals. So the last is my summary. The legal framework that I've outlined is mostly still in place and a lot of it has not been repudiated. So for example, Obama said no more torture, no more rendition, and that he closed Guantanamo within a year, but we know that detainees still remain. Um, he also made clear that the previous administration would not uh, be investigated or face any um, criticism by him because he, and it was interesting, he said they were doing what they thought was right under extreme circumstances. Trump, when questioned about Guantanamo and torture in particular, said he could do worse, and he believed in a strong executive power and used frequently the expanded powers under uh, the interpretation clauses that, that were brought up during this uh, time period. Biden's called for stronger laws that are like those passed after 9-11, um, but he would also focus more on domestic terrorism threats. And so to, to tie this all up, it all begs the question, does a ticking time bomb scenario like 9-11 justify these types of laws and courses of action? Did they and do they make us safer? And should we review them considering current events or let them stand? And it's a huge debate, I think, that's still going on. And I think it's a debate worth having. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Professor Cox. So our next presenter is going to be Professor Rick Sagel. So he's from the Trinity River campus. So thank you so much for joining us tonight. We really appreciate it. As a licensed attorney, he uh, spends his time researching and teaching on how the courts affect our daily lives. So thank you so much for being here. Yeah, thank you for having me. Let me make sure, do you hear a buzzing sound behind me? I was accused of having a loud noise behind me before. Sounds better now. Thank you. And also I see you've used a different photo for this introduction. Interesting. This one Interesting. just looks a little more professional. <laughs> okay, I think you may have forgotten. Thank you, Alyssa. No buzzing sound now. Okay, so yeah, thanks for having me. Professor Mertens Wilson. Um, so I want to start off by talking about um, kind of my memory of that day, first of all. I know a lot of you may have been young or not alive when that day happened. Um, 
my students now, uh, I teach some dual credit classes and they were born after 9-11. So it's kind of different, right? Talking about this event in history uh, when the students weren't around for it. It reminds me of, you know, older history instructors that, you know, talk about the Vietnam War, World War II, and they're around like during the time, like this guy, like who cares, right? This was so long ago. Um, but so, yeah, I, 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 uh, I was a sophomore in college uh, when 9-11 happened. Um, and I remember the day vividly. And of course, I think if you were an adult or even a teenager, you probably remember that day vividly. You remember when you heard about it, you remember what you were doing. Um, I was at home uh, on a message board because I, <laughs> I was really cool uh, as a college student. And I saw someone post about, you know, I can't believe what's happening in New York. And I turn on the news, I turn on CNN um, and uh, I see, you know, the Twin Towers. And there's one tower had been hit by a plane and shortly thereafter, the second one was hit. So, you know, those images are in my head. You've seen the replays several, several times uh, throughout the last 20 years. But what really sticks out, at, you know, of that day for me is actually unity um, and how it, strange enough, brought the country together. So my topic uh, for this presentation um, is actually the public's approval of government, Congress, before 9-11, and after 9-11, one of my favorite topics in class is talking about Congress and talking about, uh, I'm sorry, it's, polling is what I meant to say, polling. Um, you know, we get to vote. We get to vote once every year, once every two years for governor, for president, for, you know, whatever else, right? But we don't get to vote on the issues. We don't get to vote on, um, you know, war, right? That's not our job. So I think it's fascinating when pollsters ask the public, hey, what do you think about this? Do you think we should have gone to war? Do you think uh, we should have legalized same-sex marriage? Like all these questions that we don't get to answer by voting, the polling company has gotten very good at getting a snapshot, a snapshot of what Americans think. So uh, on my first slide, I talk about how um, Gallup for the last 40, 50 years has asked this question, do you approve or disapprove of the way Congress is handling its job? And I like asking this question in my class because it's one of the first things I actually talk about in my class is what do you think the people think about Congress? Like, do, do, do they like it? Do they not like it? And you can see here over the last 40, 50 years, it's gone up, it's gone down. It's mostly kind of stayed between uh, 20 and 40 percent. Um, and it's, you know, clearly had some some highs and some lows. And currently, the last polling showed it at 28 percent, 28 percent approval. Uh, that is really bad. Uh, think of, you know, President Trump, as unpopular as he was, he never got that low uh, and he was rarely under 40 approval rating. So, um, you know, the Congress historically, even in good times and bad times, people just don't like Congress. I think it's kind of fascinating. Right. And we talk about why that is and we go into possibilities of you know, why in general people don't like Congress. And um, it's interesting. So for 9-11 purposes, you can see here, there is a, a really kind of apex in 2001, um, specifically October 11th to the 14th. That was the polling period that got that 84% approval rating. Um, and boy, look how brief it was. You know, it was up in the 70s. I have a kind of a zoom in there. The the green chart shows you the the tracking over each each month and that that box in the upper right hand corner shows you kind of a closer look at right before September 11th, which had 42 percent approval. And then right after September 11th uh, in October, the next poll, literally it went up 42 points. Right. Never had that big of a, a drop or a rise. So clearly something changed on 9-11. And that was this idea that we're all together. Um, and it was weird uh, because we have our partisan differences now. We have issues with the other side, so to speak, now. But um, we had those back then, too. And um, the fact that it just jumped 42 points all of a sudden was pretty shocking. And it's not like things were good, right? We were about to start a war with Afghanistan. Uh, we were worried about future terrorist attacks. But we were brought together by that common enemy. And uh, it makes me think that I think uh, Americans might need that uh, 
to kind of get together, right? Instead of, of now our enemies are each other, uh, I believe. <laughs> the, our enemies are the other side, right? The other political party. Um, but I think in, in 2001 and for the next few months after that, our enemy was Al-Qaeda, Osama bin Laden, you know, Afghanistan. So the politics changed briefly. And to me, that's fascinating. Like to me, that that's just something, there was a flashpoint there. And eventually we, we went back to, to kind of not liking Congress, right? Um, and the next slide will show you the, um, the satisfaction, a different way of kind of asking a question, American satisfaction with the way things are going. And again, this one's been more volatile uh, with the public. And you can see 9-11 there didn't have a huge impact. Uh, it, it was around 70 percent before it was 70 percent after. But then during the war in Afghanistan, it went down. It went way down, all the way down to 7 percent um, at some point. And now it's back to being in the in the 20s and 30s. So there's different ways of asking questions about, you know, what does the public think about Congress? How about the way things are going? And uh, so I really like polling, and I think I like the way that it explains some of our voting habits. Um, so going back to the 9-11, the, the specific date of the terrorist attack, uh, that evening there was an event on the Capitol, and there were the Speaker of the House, the Senate Majority Leader, they were on the steps of the Capitol kind of speaking about what happened, what they plan to do. And after the end of the speech, they started into a song, impromptu. And the next slide I have here, hopefully the audio works. Uh, I want you guys to listen to this, this news clip of this event happening on September 11, 2001. And let's see if this works here. I'll mute myself in the meantime. It's not working because he would be talking. You'd be hearing his voice. Uh, let me try maybe to share my screen. Let me try that. Yeah, let's try it that way. OK, hold one second, please. Can you guys hear that? I don't hear it. You didn't hear it? Do you want to just give the link in the chat? Yeah, I'll give the link in the chat. So um, let's see here. Yeah, Misty, if you could do that for me. I don't have it pulled up. OK, I'm back. So. Uh, Based on that video, it's uh, I explained a little bit, but they're they're talking about the attack. They're talking about what they're going to do. And um, as they're leaving the steps of the Capitol. A group of these congressional members start singing uh, God bless America. There's a still photo of it. Thank you. Thank you, Misty. Um, <laughs> clearly, they're all mouths open They're They're in song, right? Um, and it was, again, weird, uh, literally. A week before this, there have been arguments about the debt ceiling, about the budget crisis, about cutting Social Security. And this terrorist attack makes Democrats, Republicans all sing God Bless America together. Um, and, I, you know, so watch that news clip because the, the news, the anchor that um, was covering this talks about how this is he could have never seen this coming. This is just so, so, so different. Uh, so this picture is actually pretty good here. You can see. Bernie Sanders is in this, is in this picture. Uh, he actually looks younger than he does now. He's in the top left, kind of a few people over. Uh, that's Bernie Sanders. And you have um, Kay Granger in the front wearing the pink coat. She still represents a part of part of North Texas. So you have some people in Congress still today, 20 years later, that were in Congress back then. So you have this, this kumbaya, this godless America moment. And you have this immediate unity of Americans kind of going with the Congress. And the next slide will show you Americans view of the Afghanistan war and the polls that showed, um, you know, whether we wanted it. 
And clearly, at the very beginning, like it was 90%, let's do this. We're going to take out our enemy. We have, a com- we have a common enemy. Let's take care of this. And it went up to, yeah, 90, 93% at some point was the, let's do this, right? Not a mistake to invade Afghanistan. And like with any war that goes on for, you know, more than a month or two, uh, it, it begins to get unpopular. And, you know, during Obama's presidency, it gets even more unpopular. It briefly recovers during the Trump presidency, uh, but then Joe Biden's elected and Biden makes it clear that he was going to pull troops by the September 11th, 20th anniversary date. And, um, you know, I, I wasn't planning on talking about the the pullout of, of Afghanistan. Um, that did not go as well as uh, President Biden thought it would. Um, and of course, now we have polling that shows Americans did not approve of the way we left Afghanistan. So they wanted to leave. They thought it was a mistake. But the way we left was also a mistake. So maybe the moral is the, the public doesn't know what it wants. Right. Uh, and the public's not always correct. And I do want to make that clear that the, the polling is not just because a majority of people think of something a certain way does not mean that the public should get its way. Right. But it is interesting to me to think this is I have my opinion. I know what my friends think. But like, what is what's a snapshot of America? And so the last slide I have is an indicator of um, a d- kind of a different question. And it's asking about uh, how patriotic you are or how proud of American you are to be. Um, so it breaks down by age, OK? If you're over 55 years old, you are most likely to be extremely proud. 53% of people who are over 55 are extremely proud of being American. 27 are very 50 moderate and so forth. But if you go younger, 35 to 54, it's different, right? Most are still extremely proud, but you have you have some more who are either not at all proud, um, you know, so it changed a little bit. But the biggest change is between 18 and 34. Those people are at the most only moderately proud. And uh, these are people who have, if you're, if you're between 18 and 34, you may have seen 9-11. Uh, you may have been little when you saw 9-11, um, but all you know is mostly war, right? You know the, the Afghanistan war, um, the, maybe the Iraq war, um, but you don't know much times of <laughs> pro- prosperity and of times of no war. So um, I think that has something to do with it. The older you are, uh, you've seen a little bit more of a spectrum of American, um, you know, times in America. So, um, you know, when, when 9-11 happened, People were very proud to be an American. Uh, it was at an all-time high. People were uh, very approving of Congress, very approving of the war in Afghanistan, very approving of really of giving up our liberties. Um, we were okay with taking our shoes off before we got an airplane. We were okay with um, you know drone strikes. Uh, we were okay with the government doing whatever it needed to do to prevent another terrorist attack. And I think that's probably slipping away a little bit. I don't think Americans are quite as excited about um, the government being too controlling when it comes to our, our personal liberties. So um, that's that's kind of my little presentation. Um, I do think that it's important to, um, you know, 9-11 was a, was a major event, but I think it's important we remember the unity. As brief as it was, we do have times in this country of unity. And unfortunately, it seems to happen when there is a common enemy and the enemy is, you know, usually some kind of bad guy, right? Osama bin Laden or some kind of evildoer, as George Bush said. So thank you. And I will take any questions that were asked my way at the end, I think. Thank you. All right. Our next presenter is Joan Johnson. Professor Johnson is an assistant professor of government at the Connect campus and has been at TCC for 15 years. She likes to focus her research on civic engagement, civil liberties, and she's worked with HBCUs, Ask Every Student, the All In Challenge, and Voter Friendly Campus. So welcome, Professor Johnson. Thank you so much, Misty. I'm so happy you guys are here. Um, So right now, what we're gonna talk about, um, really it's like three things uh, in one. We're gonna look at the Department of Homeland Security and then in connection with that, we're going to talk about the 9-11 Commission that has been mentioned um, and also the Director of National Intelligence. And we're going to try to bring it from the past to today and what's going on in those 
in that regard. So we can just skip ahead to DHS established if you'd like to, Misty. Next slide, please. Oh, there you go. Thank you. So we know 9-11 happens. One year later, they decide to create the Department of Homeland Security because Homeland Security is of the utmost importance um, in response to that, those attacks. It doesn't become operational until 2003. They do identify the primary goals of this entity to be to prevent terror to terrorism and enhance security, to strengthen specifically aviation security, to secure and ma manage both our northern and southern borders, um, to enforce and administer immigration laws, to strengthen national preparedness like national natural disasters, um, and to safeguard and secure cyberspace, which is something you know that we all contend with today. Next slide, please. Thank you. So when they created the Department of Homeland Security, as Professor Cox mentioned, they took 22 agencies and lumped them together into one, thinking that if you have them as a cohesive unit answering to one person, it will bring about better homeland security. So from this chart, you can see it's anything from Secret Service to U.S. Citizenship and Immigration Services to the Coast Guard in times of peace. If it's a time of war, they go back and at work with the Department of Defense. The Transportation Security Administration, in which you're very familiar with if you've flown anywhere. Um, and then ICE was there, Immigration and Customs Enforcement. You know, they've been in the news quite a bit recently. And then they also have Federal Law Enforcement Training Center under there, too, because we'll, 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 we'll I'll explain that when we get a little bit later in this presentation. So it's it's a big old group of a lot of different people put under one cabinet in the hopes that we'll bring about greater homeland security. Next slide, please. So if you look, that's okay, you can just stay there. If you look at the DHS today, um, Alejandro Mayorkas is our current Secretary of Homeland Security. And their stated mission is to safeguard the American people, our homeland, and our values. Now, what we actually you do need to back up a little bit. I'm sorry. No, okay, keep going. Um, the 9 11 Commission was formed. I think the slides are a little bit out of order, but it's all good. And the reason why I bring up the 9-11 Commission, because their report isn't completed until after the Department of Homeland Security was formed, is that some of the recommendations that they come up with um, help further define and clarify what the Department of Homeland Security is going to do. Okay, so we always refer to it as the 9-11 Commission, but its actual name was the National Commission on Terrorist Attacks Upon the United States. It was completely bipartisan, split five, five, five Republicans and five Democrats. Um, like I said, they don't get their report issued until 2004 because it was a massive undertaking. Um, they had 80 people helping them with this report because ultimately when they finish it, it's more than 500 pages and 14 chapters long. And they issue 41 recommendations on how to better improve Homeland Security. Um, and so those recommendations, I'm not going to go through all 41, don't worry. Um, next slide, please, thank you. But some of the, there's that slide, that's okay, we can move right on past it. The recommendations included creating a, a uh, director of national security and screening at airports and interagency communication over airwaves. The reason why they decided they needed to create a director of national intelligence is because they didn't believe that all the intelligence gathering organizations, and y'all, there are a ton of them. It's not just the CIA and the FBI. You've got military intelligence. Each branch has its own intelligence. The Department of Defense has intelligence. And so they feared that what happened was those, those groups didn't share information as, the, as they should have, which could have prevented um, perhaps some of the events that transpired. So if you create a national uh, director of national intelligence and who's receiving all this stuff, then they're going to work more cohesively together. And the DNI works closely with the secretary of the Department of Homeland Security. Um, of course, the major focus at the time was screening at airports because, you know, we know what happened in the attacks. And so, like I said before, if you've flown, you know that they have... Um, really amped up security when you're trying to get on a plane. 
um, whether it's body scans or limited amount of liquids and so forth and so on. And then the other issue that they found um, was a problem of communication between the different levels of law enforcement that were all trying to respond to this horrific event. Um, they were using different radio frequencies, so they couldn't necessarily talk to one another, and they were using different nomenclature. And so when they were trying to talk to each other using codes, the codes didn't um, translate to one another. So now we have a dedicated radio frequency, and they're using common nomenclature, which ties back to the fact that uh, law enforcement training centers are now under the Department of Homeland Security. So those were some of the big recommendations that, that they came up with. Now let's switch our attention and we can go to the next slide. Um, keep going to keep going. Thank you. Yes, to the director of national intelligence. And so the DNI and the DHS work closely together because they're both all about protecting the homeland security. We know that when we talked about the origination of these positions, it was to protect us from terrorist attacks from terrorists outside the United States. Well, I'd like to bring it to today because I like to make things, you know, this does affect our daily lives and make things relevant. And today we'll find that um, the concern is domestic terrorism. Not to say, I'm not, to, not inferring that they're not concerned about terrorist attacks from external groups as well, but here lately the focus has been on attacks from within the homeland okay so what we're going to look at briefly um are conspiracies here's what they've identified the dhs and the dni as some major issues that we need to be paying attention to conspiracies surrounding the 2020 election and QAnon, domestic violent extremists white supremacist groups and then social media and its connection to those three things i just listed and we know that social media impacts like everything. And so it's very much at play here. So let's look at conspiracy surrounding the 2020 election and QAnon. That they list one of the biggest concerns. Next slide, please. So QAnon in 2019, the FBI designated them as a domestic terrorist threat because of its potential to incite extremist violence. Um, a new federal intelligence report that came out just in August warned that adherents of QAnon um, could target Democrats and other political opponents for more violence as the movement's false prophecies increasingly fail to come true. Um, in August, on August 9th, the DHS issued an alert to law enforcement at all levels saying it's providing awareness of reports regarding an increased but modest level of activity, online calling for violence in response to unsubstantiated claims of fraud related to the 2020 election and the alleged reinstatement of former President Trump. So when they say these false prophecies that fail to come true, there's been time and time again where this QAnon, Q, who sends out these posts through 8chan and other media outlets online is saying that Trump was going to be reinstated in president and then it doesn't happen. And so they're worried about um, maybe an, up, an uptick in violence as a result. Uh, next slide, please. Thank you. Now, what is QAnon? You could do a whole semester long presentation on QAnon, but um, QAnon uh, they cling to a wide-ranging, completely unfounded theory that says that former President Trump is waging a secret war against elite Satan-worshipping pedophiles in government, business, and the media. And they believe that once those people are discovered, the pedophiles, people like Hillary Clinton and Tom Hanks, the actor, will be executed. And now, wrapped into this belief of Satan, Satan-worshipping pedophiles, um, they've tied it to the big lie, which is that there was fraud in the election of 2020, which we know is completely false. And they truly believe that that Trump is going to be reinstated as president. And this is why uh, DNI and the DHS are very much concerned about QAnon and their adherence. Okay, next slide of, that discusses a concern 
that both the and DHS have in terms of Homeland Security Day, again, is from attacks from within. So domestic violence extremists. The definition of a domestic violence extremist is an individual based and operating primarily in the U.S. without direction or inspiration from a foreign terrorist group or other foreign power and who seeks to further political or social goals wholly or in part through unlawful acts of force or violence. And uh, the FBI director, Christopher Ray, um, recently stated that the insurrection on January 6th was not an isolated event, that the problem of domestic terrorism has been metastasizing across the country for a very long time now, and it's not going away anytime soon. Um, at the FBI, we've been sounding the alarm in it for a number of years now. So both both the DNI and DHS have come out issuing warnings about this as well. A current event that something that's upcoming that they have expressed concern about is a rally that's going to be taking place on September 18th in our capital um, that organizers are calling Justice for J6. Uh, they're arguing that the more than 600 people that have been arrested for we saw the insurrection on January 6th and the attacks on police officers and we, we saw all that. But they're arguing that they're political prisoners um, and that they should be set free. And so they're planning a rally at that time. And <clears throat> they've issued, uh, DHS and DNS, DNI have issued concerns about the rally. They're actually trying to determine whether or not we need to bring back the fencing that um, to, to put up around the, uh, the Capitol like we had following January 6th for some time. So that's something to pay attention to in the upcoming weeks. Uh, the next group, next slide please, thank you so much, Misty, uh, would be white supremacists. Um, and you know, when we look at these domestic terrorists, could be some QAnon members, could be some white supremacists, could be groups that don't fall under either umbrella, but all of these things are interconnected. And according to the Southern Poverty Law Center, um, we've got more than 950 hate groups active in the United States. And we've seen a 55% increase in the number of hate groups just since 2017. This is truly alarming. Um, when we look at racist propaganda, flyers, posters, banners um, displayed, in 2020, it was two times the amount that we saw in 2019. And I want you to hear this and hear this now, that when we look at the groups that, um, the group that was attributed with, with displaying and promoting and sending out all that hateful propaganda, 90% of it came from a group in Texas called the Patriot Front. So this is, this is all around us and in our backyard and, and we need to be paying attention to this stuff. Okay, uh, next slide, please. Propaganda is horrifying enough, but even worse is when you actually harm or kill people. Um, hate crimes, the number of hate crimes reported, these are all FBI statistics, by the way. The number of hate crimes reported in 2020 was the highest recorded in over a decade. Um, there were more than 7,700 incidents, which was a 6% 6 increase from 2019. And like I said, the highest number of hate crimes since 2008. And 2008 still had the most, and that just happens to coincide when Barack Obama was elected president. So um, the other alarming fact that we've seen about hate crimes is the attacks on Asian Americans in our country. They've, we've seen a 150% increase of hate crimes targeting Asian Americans. So these are all things that are very much of a concern to Homeland Security and, and should be to all of us as well. Okay, last slide, please, and thank you. So the other thing that the DNI and the DHS are concerned about would be social media. Um, we know that, well, everybody uses it, and so do these groups like QAnon and white supremacists and domestic violent, uh, domestic violent terrorists. So one of the concerns was perhaps our intelligence communities didn't do a good enough job paying attention to what was being said and planned on social media leading up to January 6th. 
which is why in part there wasn't enough security when what happened happened. Um, when we look at like hate speech and social media, it's amazing that it wasn't until 2019 that Facebook began banning white supremacist groups. Um, in direct response to the rise in domestic terrorist threats and to white supremacist groups and to QAnon adherents and, and everything we've talked about, the DHS, while it does monitor uh, social media outlets, it's looking right now into hiring private companies to assist in analyzing social media threats, which is tied to Professor Cox's discussion of collection of data under the Patriot Act, because anytime that you see something like this, um, you can have issues of privacy be a concern and First Amendment right issues and that kind of a thing. But as you can see, the Department of Homeland Security um, is still very active in our lives. And now a big chunk of their focus is going to be on actual homeland terrorists rather than external threats, although they're still paying attention to that as well. So thank you so much. And that, that ends my discussion. Thank you, Professor Johnson. So I know we're very short on time now, and I know that all of you are very concerned about how you're going to get credit for this. So if you go look in the chat, I just put the link to the form to get credit. Fill that out. Make sure you include your full name and the professor who sent you to this. And then once that form is filled out, um, at the end of the week when all of these other presentations are done, I will send out a master list to all the professors, and that's how you'll get credit for attending. If you're interested in coming to any of our other 9-11 events that we have going on this week, tomorrow we're going to be discussing stories of 9-11, so oral histories and fiction. At uh, Thursday, we're going to talk about the airlines after 9-11 with a professor who used to work for Southwest. And then Thursday night, we're going to talk about the scientific advancements that have been made from this. And then we have our closing presentation from Northeast professors called Discarded Shoes, 9-11 in History and Memory happening on Friday. And we're hoping that by the time we're done with all of these events, as you watch coverage over the weekend, you will be a well-informed and very savvy viewer, and even maybe a critic of the coverage you're gonna see. Because some of the coverage you're gonna see is gonna be really good and some of it's not gonna be as good. All right, if you guys have any questions, please put them in the chat. Otherwise, please fill out that form. And thank you so much for making time to come here tonight. Hey, Miss, do we have <clears throat> one of our students has their hand up? Ver Veronica, are you welcome? Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't see that. You're welcome to turn your mic on, Veronica. Actually, she might not be able to. Veronica, you might need to type your question in the chat. Jason, that's a great question. He asked um, if the professors will be notified how many times we attend. Yes, they get a separate attendance sheet for every single event. So that's why it's important when you click on that form that you're going to the one for this event. If you came to the one earlier today, don't use the same link. They're different links. I put the link in the chat one more time. Last call for the link. And thank you so much for our presenters being here tonight. I really appreciate it. I know y'all don't have to take time out of your evenings with your families to do this, but our students really enjoy it. And we really appreciate having these events. So thank you so much. And thank you students for coming as well. Thank you, enjoyed it.
Thanks, Kimberly. Thanks. Is it okay to go ahead and go? Yeah, go, go. I'm going to okay. I just make sure. Out. Nope, you are good. I'm so sorry. I forgot sorry. your introduction. I'm oh, so no, sorry. no, don't worry about it. My mouse was having an issue too, so I apologize. I was going, oh, no, it's a wireless mouse. I think next time I'll plug in one so it doesn't have a glitch. But anyway, I apologize for that. No, it was great. Thank you. It was a wild night, man. Sorry. He <laughs> was going, no, don't fail me now, technology. <laughs> thanks. All right. Well, thanks. Have a good night. You too. Bye. Bye.